So we don't actually have any more syntax to discuss in a formal sense. We have to talk about one more thing that is mostly working around how the server works. Uh, so it's how to work with dates and times. And to be clear, you're not actually going to, this will never show up on an exam, but it will be a big deal on assignments because we need to work with these columns in the database whose types are dates and times. And the functions to work with these depend on the individual SQL implementation. So it's not actually standard SQL, it's functions defined by each database system. So the way this is handled in SQL Lite and the way this is handled in Postgres differ. So really, all there is to it is a bunch of functions to extract, for example, from a date or time. So I'm today I am on the Ferries three months database. Uh, and we, we need that because the dates and times in the fruit database are not complicated enough to justify this. But suppose I select something from the sailings table, and you've seen this already on the assignment. The sailings table has lots of things in it, but it has these columns for departure and arrival times. Um, and the columns seem to contain a full date and time pair. And if I want to ask a question like this, find all the sailings of this vessel on February 29th, that's a bit of a tough one because, I mean, how do I go into the date and find a sp the, the dates matching a specific pattern? So I, I can also, uh, I mean, I, to, just to, as an appetizer, I can pretty easily uh, ask for sailings of that particular vessel. So that's fine. And there it is. Um, but I want only the ones from February 29th. Here's, here's one of them here, for example. Uh, you'll notice there are three columns in, the, in, in this data set, schedule, departure, actual departure, and arrival. Just to be clear, many of you have taken the ferry, but the ferry, there might be a 12 o'clock ferry scheduled. It might leave a minute early or 20 minutes late. Um, and so we keep track of both of those things, and then it arrives at some time later. Generally, we consider that the time it took for the ferry to travel is the difference between this time and this time, although just to be clear, if these exercises today say one definition and the assignment says another, for the assignment, do whatever it says. So what I want is the ability to talk about sailings that happened at a specific time. This is not, as I said, new SQL notation. It's just functions that Postgres uses. And in the posted data for this, I will include this link to Postgres's manual page. You can take a look at it. So there's actually nothing new here, just the, the exact syntax, the, the notation, I guess, not really syntax, notation that we have to use to get specific things. So the prompt was find all of the, sa of the sailings on February 29th. Um, it points out for the sake of making the example easy, there's no year involved. It's not February 29th, 2020, because the data set doesn't go back that far that, to make a difference. There's only one February 29th in there. And even if it went back three years, there's still only, only be one February 29th. But of course, we could all, it, maybe you can guess how you generalize this. So first, I'm going to say, what I want is this, where vessel name is equal to that. Um, and let's justify this. And something like month equals two and day equals 29. That, that's conceptually what I want. But there is no column called month, and there's no column called day. And in fact, there are three different dates in the data set. So which one am I talking about? So Postgres does this. First off, these columns have type date, or date time, or timestamp. They're, they're a unified object to refer to the entire date and time. If you want to query the object for attributes of the date, so for example, the minute number or something, then you have to use a function called extract. And I do not like the notation. This is, an, this is another example. This is not SQL. This is Postgres. But man, I'm not fond of this notation. Um, so I want extract month from the column called schedule departure. And I'm going to schedule the departure. I'm going to assume that the day of a sailing is the day that the sailing left, the, the day it was scheduled to depart. Um, and the assignment makes it clear what it means if it ever says that. Uh, and extract day from scheduled departure is equal to 29. And I run this and I'll notice now I am only selecting those sailings um, with this vessel on February 29th. Now, remember, on, on assignment four, we're going to be even more stringent about this. The queries are designed to test your ability to understand this. When we say sailings leaving February 29th, it's true that none of these sailings got in on March 1st or something. 
but we can't assume that they didn't. It's possible for a sailing that leaves on February 29th to not arrive until early the following morning or something similar. Generally, sailings of this vessel might only be two hours long, but there have been cases, including we may actually have some in our data sets buried from a couple of years ago, where it gets caught in a storm or something and the ferry leaves at 9 p.m. and isn't actually able to get to port until the following morning at 10 a.m. Just be glad you're not actually on that, that, that voyage. So um, we use this notation to pull stuff out of columns, and we can do that in a where clause we can do it up here in the column selection. We could even use it like buried inside of subqueries or as join conditions or something. So the purpose of this video is mostly just let, let's do more applied SQL, um, but uh, also let's talk about how to do dates and times. So the next one is from this query above, let's modify it to also select the actual departure hour, not the schedule, the actual departure hour um, and the minute of each of those sailings. So I'm going to extract the hour from actual departure. You might be wondering, what are you allowed to extract? Month, day, year, hour, minute. You can, all, you can use all of those. This is not a string. It's just some keyword, hour, month. There are a few others we'll see in a minute. Um, hour from actual departure as I'm going to call this departure hour. And then extract minute from actual as departure minute. And now we can see it, we have it, it, the departure was 526 a.m., 1014, um, and uh, up, up until um, uh, 10 minutes to 6 in the evening. So I can use the extract function to pull out any individual thing, and you'll notice in the assignment it asks you to do that over and over again, and that's how we do it. Um, so this next one is giving away a little bit of, of assignment stuff, although to be clear, the actual um, value it's defining is a tiny bit different in um, the assignment, although the method I'm going to use here will do just fine. Like it, It'll work, but be careful. Do not, if you copy and paste this, you do so at your own risk um, because the duration is defined a little bit differently. So what I want to know, and what you're going to want to know a lot in the assignment, is how long did the sailing take? It left and then it arrived later. How many minutes or whatever was that? The reason you care is you want to do analytics um, like how often is this vessel late or how often is this particular route known for sailings being late? So I'm going to select, um, I'm going to start by, if you select the entire date column, scheduled departure. Oh, actually, sorry, it says of the sailings above. I should be careful. I should keep this. Okay, so. I've got my query from above. Um, I'm going to select, I'm going to pull the entire scheduled departure column out. If you select a column with a date in it, you get the entire date at once. Um, so I'm just going to do this for the sake of being able to see how the, to see my data as I work with it. Um, there are three date columns. They are scheduled departure, actual departure, and arrival. We can see there they are. Um, I'm going to see if I can choose, all of these have, um, Let's see if we have one that works pretty well. Okay, so here we have a sailing that was scheduled to leave at 10.15, but it actually left at 10.14 a.m., and it arrived 12.15, which is just under two hours, which is uh, two hours and one minute later, so 121 minutes. That's the duration of this sailing. Um, here is something that left at 3.13 in the afternoon and arrived at 5.16, so it took two hours and three minutes. What I want to work out is the exact number of minutes of each sailing. So the problem here is that I do not want to work with hours and minutes. Like I don't want to have to say, okay, what's 516 minus 313? Because that's a nightmare. There's so many special cases there, you do not want to have to do that, especially if you have to write query after query that does that. Here is my recommendation. You don't have to follow it, but be very careful if you don't, because it's actually surprisingly tough to work uh, to deal with all the problems that arise if you work directly with hour and minute. Things like what happens if the sailing arrives early the next morning or something like that. There is one other option that you can extract. It's this value called epoch. Um, so those of you that have taken CSC360, and maybe some of you that have not, might be aware that on Unix machines, um, I'm gonna, I'll just call this E and we'll take a look at it. On uh, The standard for the last 50 years for the Unix system for storing times is to store a time as an integer, as an unsigned int value. And the value is the number of seconds that have elapsed since um, a specific, uh, since I think January 1st, 1970. 
uh, or something similar. Um, and uh, that's a surprise, it's a weird arbitrary number, but the reason why it's sort of nice is that um, if you are storing every time as a number of seconds, it's really easy to do arithmetic on times. You just subtract one number from another. Um, and that's what I intend to do here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to extract the epoch value from the arrival time. That's the number of seconds since 1970, since the arrival time. I'm going to ex subtract from that the number of seconds that had elapsed as of the, um, I guess it says the actual departure time. And we'll see what that is. I'll call this E again. So 6,900 seconds between um, the actual departure and the arrival. 7,200 seconds. If I want to know how many minutes that is, all I have to do is take this result, which is now a number of seconds, a duration in seconds, and divide it by 60. And so we can see, just like I said earlier, 121 minutes, 123 minutes. So I'm going to call this duration minutes. Now remember, on the assignment, I think it doesn't use actual departure, it uses scheduled departure, but it's the same logic. And I strongly recommend that you use this method and not some weird formula involving hour and minute values because that can lead to all sorts of trouble. Um, so here I've, I now have computed the total number of minutes of each sailing. And I think I'll preemptively copy that because maybe I'll need it in a minute. Okay, so select all dates on which the vessel had any sailings at all. Uh, and we'll notice that this is actually asking us to give a date value as a column. It's not saying give me a random time, like 7.22 in the morning. It's saying I want 2020, February 29th, not no other timestamp value. Um, and uh, I have a couple of options here, and I want to show them both off. This is, this is a contrived example. The purpose of the contrived example is just to show the different ways that we could do this. So first, what I'm going to do, the first way I'm going to tackle this is I'm just going to say, how about this? We'll just select. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll start with uh, maybe an, an easier, let's try, let's use our query from above. Um, and I'm going to just do this. There is a function in Postgres called make date. And make date takes three values, a year, month, and a day. So let's do 2020 um, and then, I don't know, June 1st. Call it D. And you can see that if you call the make date function and you give it three values, it gives you a single date object. And what that means is if I want, I could extract the um, year from my scheduled departure. Um, year from scheduled departure. And I'm going to do some copy and paste here because there's only so much patience one can have for this. Uh, and I'm going to select my month from my scheduled departure. And I'm going to select my day. And it's going to complain. And it, maybe you can see it's warning us to try something here. But let's see what it does. Um, it's OK. Maybe you can't read that. It's saying, OK, make date doesn't exist. That's not very helpful. What a, what a useful warning database system. We just used it. We know it exists. Okay, what it's actually complaining about is there's no make date function that takes three double values. Double meaning that apparently the extract function returns a float, not an int. And make date is supposed to take integer values because there's no such thing as June the seven and a half, I guess. Um, in Postgres, if you have a value of a given type and you want to force it into a different type, so perform a cast, you do this which of course, in keeping with all of our other, all of the other notation I've complained about lately, this is the most bizarre looking cast I've ever seen. It's almost like they, they went and found a C++ cast and created the most deliberate mockery of it they could possibly do. Because this is not only looks nothing like a cast in any language I've ever seen, it seems to look a lot like a different feature of C++ that has nothing to do with casts. So in any case, this is a cast and it forces a, for example, double to be an int. And so here, I've taken the, um, the, the year, month, and day out of the departure field and reassembled them into a single date object by themselves. Now, the reason why this is helpful is if I just do this for all sailings, so I'm going to um, do this, and I'm not going to even bother um, filtering by date, then I, I'm going to end up getting a date object for every sailing that ever occurred. And we'll notice there are multiple date objects for the same day because the, the, the vessel had four sailings on this day and it had two sailings on March 20th and two on March 22nd and 
It's been sitting around doing nothing since then, I guess. Um, but there's an easy remedy to that. We can just say, okay, just don't, don't print the duplicates. And now we have a separate date object for every single distinct day that the ship had any sailings because we basically make a set of all the possible date objects and then reduce it to remove duplicates. So that's one option. Remember, this will not be on an exam, so you don't need to worry about memorizing arbitrary notation like this. There's a second option, and I, that's why I had to preface the second option with it. It won't be on an exam. I, I would hate, I, I would loathe having to memorize this because this is such a, a ridiculous, weird, obscure piece of notation. There is a function buried in the library somewhere. I'm going to um, duplicate this. I'm also going to call this sailing date. All right, so I'm going to duplicate this. Um, there is a function in the library uh, to do something very similar to what we just did. So what exactly is scheduled departure? It is a combination of date and time. What I've done is I've basically taken it and rounded it down to a day. I, I just ignored the hour, minute, and second. I've truncated my date to be just a day. So there, it turns out for some reason there is a function in the library that does exactly that. Um, so you tell it and you, for some reason you have to give it a string to tell it this. Tell it what to truncate the date to. So in this case, I'll truncate it to day level. And then I give it my column, scheduled departure. Um, and uh, well, let's see what happens if we do this. Okay, so what it gives me back is a timestamp. So it does give me a year, month, day, hour, minute, second that's been truncated down to, to round out all of the hour, minute, and second. If I want to get a legitimate date out of that, not, not that, if I want to get a, a legitimate date out of that, I can cast it to the type date, which is does not include hour, minute, and second. Um, so we end up with this. So this is weird. I, this is a nice shortcut. You save some typing. If you, if you for some reason know how to do this, not going to be on an exam. Um, so that's another option that you have there. It can be helpful because once you have something like this, you can just keep it around and keep recycling it. Um, so what I want to do now is, uh, let's save this one for later. For every day on which this vessel had any sailings, list how many sailings it had. So um, I'm going to go back and start with this. So notice how I, I didn't do select distinct. Here I've got, okay, four sailing dates. Of, they're the same for 216, 2 on 217. I interpret this to mean that, and if I, if I look at scheduled departure, I would assume that what's happened is there were four sailings on that day, four distinct sailings, and they got boiled down into one date object. So what I could think is, if I just want to know how many sailings occurred on that day, all I really have to do is to group by uh, well, this, but it's not going to, it's, oh, it, oh okay. Um, I was about to say we ought to be cautious about this because it's not going to let me rename the column and then group by it, but it's um, sometimes Postgres is a bit too clever for itself. So if you were worried that you can't rename the column until after it exists, you actually are allowed, you, it would be fine to put this inside of a nested query and that would work too. But since, since I, I, um, uh, I, I did that, then I guess we'll, we'll put up with it. Uh, Okay, so in any case, I can group by that, which means I can always stick a count in there as sailing count. Uh, and so it takes, uh, I, mm, I guess we'll order by sailing date as well. All right, so 216, there were four sailings. 217, there were two sailings. 229, there were six sailings, as we saw above. Um, so the reason we're doing query five is to demonstrate that objects of type date can be used for grouping just like anything else. Two dates are equal and would define the same group if they have the same month, day, and year. And it doesn't matter if I construct them with this weird date trunk function or whether I construct them with make date. So we'll move on down to the next one. Query number six. For each of the days that Queen of New Westminster had a sailing, find the date of the next day on which that vessel had any sailings. So in this case, I'm going to get rid of the aggregation here. Um, the next day, Ooh, okay, so uh, there are a couple ways of doing this. Uh, in the spirit of modernity, I'm going to do it with the, the, the thing we've seen most recently. So we'll go back to this. Here is a list of all sailings um, with the duplicates included. Uh, and if I do select distinct, 
I now have all of the days where there uh, was a, at least one sailing. And what I want is to know, okay, if you told me it did a sailing on 229, could you tell me when did it do the next sailing? What was the next day it did anything? Well, that would be 37. But I need to know that in this row. So how do I get in the same row the value that would come next if I sorted all the rows by date? And I think this does sound suspiciously like um, a, a window function problem. So I'm going to call this table, this nested query, sailing dates. And I'm going to get rid of the order by because I don't really need to order stuff internally like this. So just we'll just uh, verify that everything works. Let's start from sailing dates. Great. Um, and what I want to select now is, I guess, sailing date. And I, I suppose um, I want the next day that the, that the ship had any sailings after this date. In other words, if I sort the list by date, I want the smallest date that comes after the current one in the list. Okay, so I could try something like this. The minimum of sailing date over those rows, if I order by sailing date, um, let's just get that out of the way. If I order by sailing date, then I want those rows between the one after this and the one at the very end. Now we know that the minimum date is just going to be the next one over, but we can state it in this form and the database will have to figure that out itself. It, it'll be reasonably obvious to it because of the way that we phrase everything. Um, uh, unbounded following. And we'll call that next sailing date. Uh, and then I do this. Okay, so fair enough. Let's just uh, so D Beaver was complaining there because I had forgotten to get rid of a new line somewhere. Um, so here, 216, 217, 229, 37. The assignment contains a couple of places where if you're not careful, then you fall into a trap where you assume that every vessel sails on every day or that every route has a sailing on every day. Remember that the, the database, first off, it's actually a real data set. So it, it, it is the, the actual, as far as we know, BC Ferries sailings going back three years. But there are days when certain routes had no sailings at all. There are, there are days when certain major routes had no sailings. If you look in the one month data set, there is an entire major route that, as far as I can tell, has run every day from the day I was born until the end of March and then stopped running and, hasn't, and, and only started running again about a week and a half ago. So there was an entire two months when the oldest route between the island and Vancouver, the one between Nanaimo and Horseshoe Bay, didn't run at all. So we have to make sure that we design our queries assuming that there could be holes in the data, not just because our data set could be incomplete, but because weird stuff could happen. And the point of designing queries the way we're doing in this course is to be able to not make assumptions about our data, because in many cases, any assumptions we make, even if we think we know a lot about our data, could turn out to be wrong, because whoever designed that database system maybe 30 years ago may not have ever thought there'd be a pandemic and ferry routes would be shut down. So here I am selecting the date of each sailing and I'm using window functions to find a related piece of information in the window of sailings nearby. There's a second way of doing it that I will post that is a more mechanical um, uh, join-based alternative, uh, similar to a lot of the sort of annoying multi-layer joins that we've been doing so far in the course. And so you can take a look at that. You can also try it out um, to see if you can solve it without window functions. Now we have this. Determine the maximum difference in um, days between these dates. So just to be clear, it's referring to the output of this query. So notice that here it went one day between sailings. It sailed on 216, then 217. Here it went, um, let's see, it went 12 days, 217 to 229. And here it went seven days. And so what I want to know is, what is the largest number of days that passed between these two things? And the way I'm going to tackle this is I'm going to say, look, largest or not, I first have to figure out how do I determine the number of days between two dates. Now, just like the duration of a sailing, there is a way of doing this with the month and day values. Do not do that. Please do not do that. You don't deserve the uh, amount of sleep you will lose trying to make that work. 
Um, so, sorry, you do deserve to get sleep. You don't deserve the amount of sleep loss, just to be clear. Please get sleep. Um, so uh, the reason is because month and day, if you do arithmetic based on month and day, then when you have two dates that wrap across a month boundary, like this one here, it can be a real nightmare to figure out, figure it out because of like how many days does each month have? Is 229 the last day of the month? Well, it depends. What year is it? Because if it's a leap year, then it is. Otherwise, it isn't. Um, so instead, what we should do is try and use perform arithmetic um, on dates that, uh, I don't know, I ideally are, uh, provides, like, we get the database to tell us those facts. Because we know that, you know, like any other language, the database probably has library functions that can work with dates, just like how it was able to work with, um, just like how it was able to work with uh, the duration of a sailing. So first I'm going to say uh, sailing and next sailing as, and I'm just going to make my previous query one big nested query here. And then we can try and do filtering based on the result. Um, okay, so we have that. Um, so I, I guess uh, what I want basically is to figure out if I subtract the next sailing date from the sailing date, I want to know the largest difference between them. So let's, let's just see what happens if I try subtracting it. I mean, this is the usual thing in a programming language. Unless The manuals are never fun to read, so what we'll do is just try stuff and then only read the manual if we give up. So I'll start by selecting sailing date and next sailing date. And then, um, I guess like before, I better clean up my query a bit. Select sailing date and select next sailing date. And then, I don't know, let's just try subtracting the two from each other. And uh, the editor is sort of fighting with me about how it's displaying the text. There we go. Next sailing date minus sailing date. Let's just see if it puts up with it. Okay, it did something. Um, so if I have two date objects, which I, I do here because remember up at the top, I forced this to be a date and not a time. If you subtract two times, you don't get this, but I subtracted two dates. So if I subtract two date objects, well, a date is a month, day, and a year. And it turns out that what I get if I subtract them in Postgres, not examinable, just for the assignment, what I get is a number of days between them. So between 2.16 and 2.17, there was one day. Um, between 217 and 229, there were 12 days. Now, what it's actually asking um, is the maximum difference in days. So I suppose, and it, it points out that when two dates are subtracted, you get a number. Um, it, it sort of phrases it differently. It says the number of days without a sailing. So really, there were actually zero days between these two days with no sailing, right? There is a sailing here and a sailing here. So the number of days without a sailing was actually not one, it was zero, because we don't count the two days on either end. So I'm actually going to subtract off one, and then we'll do as days without a sailing. We try that. Okay, so now I've actually been able to determine the number of days using a combination of window functions and the nice data arithmetic that I eventually can get used to in Postgres to um, determine uh, the number of day consecutive days, the number of, for each uh, particular date, the run of dates without a sailing. Um, what I need to do now is I need to figure out what the largest number is. So I'm actually going to do, um, or let's do runs without sailings as. And maybe we can see what I really, to get the, what the query wants, all I really have to do is to aggregate this table. Now, in an assignment, you could be asked something like, don't just tell me the, the number of days you went. Tell me exactly when that happened. I want to know when was that run, that long run without a sailing. And that's something that doesn't require too much advanced stuff. That just requires the usual case of computing the number you want, then joining it back in. So runs between sailings. That gives me what I just what I uh, have already. Really, it doesn't exist. Runs. Oh, runs without. Okay. Um, good. Okay. So uh, what I want is just the maximum of that last column. And it's eleven. So this vessel went eleven days without a sailing. So here is something to think about. 
uh, th that's that's the end of the query. But uh, I want to notice something from here. Right now, it is mid-June, and this vessel apparently hasn't sailed since March. Now, we don't want to make assumptions because the data set ended in mid-May, so maybe the vessel has sailed again. But what if the question asked, could you, tell, could you count this run from March 22nd to the present as a, a number of days without sailings and report that instead? See if you stare at this, see if there's a way of incorporating that information into it. Or maybe, and this is a harder one, um, but the data set ended on May 14th, so I guess it's not fair to count any day after that. But we should assume that there were no sailings of this vessel from March 22nd all the way to May 14th. Why doesn't that get defined as a run without sailings? Uh, and so that's one thing to think about. That is a, a that is the kind of question you don't see on an assignment because it's it's too open ended. Like when is the last date we should consider? If the data set ends, like what do we do about dates after that? But it is possible to fold that in, to consider the fact that if it's still not sailing, that counts as a long run without sailings. Uh, all of this hopefully was enough of an introduction to the date functions to get you started on assignment four. They're not that bad. It's this new type called date, which you can use less than and greater than. You can order them. You can subtract them. These weird functions to prepare date objects and the ability to work with times. So we can extract month, day, and year. We can extract hour and minute. We can extract this epoch value to do arithmetic and get durations of sailings. Um, but once you have that, ultimately what you're doing with these assignment queries isn't really date and time stuff. It's mostly actual data analysis. Once you have those numbers, you're working with them just like any other numbers.